Hi, and welcome back to PDA Dad UK. In this episode, I'm going to be looking at the relationships we have with professionals and the people around us who are helping us to support our kids and the people we care for, how to build those relationships and how to speak with professionals in a way that's going to get the places we need to go without alienating them. So hi, as I say, welcome back to PDA Dad UK. Before we go on any further, I really want you to go hit like, hit subscribe and ring the bell so that you know when we've got new content coming up on the channel. It's so important and it makes such a difference to how this message gets out to the other people. The YouTube algorithms pick up on it and it sends it out to more people who get to watch it and hopefully are supported by the work we're doing here. So please go do that. It makes a big difference to me. And if you want to do it while you're there, just go and put a comment in this comment section that would be fantastic too, it all helps. As I say, what we're gonna be looking at in this episode is the relationships we have with professionals and the people that are there helping us support our loved ones. My own personal journey with this has been very fraught because, and I'm sure you'll all agree with this, it's not an easy system to navigate. And it seems that we have to fight for every single bit of support we get. And it's a broken system, I've said it many times on this channel. We live in a broken system and we have to make that work for us one way or another. And the ways that I found that really make that work is by engaging with the professionals in a positive way. And at first that was really hard. We went through an extremely challenging experience trying to get my daughter diagnosed. I've said in previous episodes, it took eight years for us to get to the point where we actually had a diagnosis in spite of the fact that everyone working with my daughter acknowledged that she was autistic and that she was a PDA. -er. So what I want to look at is how I've changed in my approach and the, the benefits I've been able to achieve by changing my approach with professionals. As I say, we went through a very challenging process and it's difficult not to carry that with you. What I mean by that is I would tend to go into meetings already with a chip on my shoulder and it would sit there and I would be defensive, I would be argumentative and I would be aggressive because it was the only way I felt I could get heard because it, I'd told my story so many times. We'd gone through my daughter's traits and symptoms so many times. We'd gone through so many different areas of different parts of government and council and uh, the NHS trying to get the diagnosis in place. And every time you feel like you get punched back down time and time and time again, to the point that you're so worn down, you just become this little bitter husk. And that's certainly where I was at. And I had to work a way to overcome that. I'm a very relational person. I always have been. And I find important friendships and, and those relationships I have with people important. I need to get on with most people, even if I've had some kind of a disagreement or an argument or a, you know, a differing view with someone. I want to come out the other end where at least we can shake hands and walk away. When it comes to professionals, it can be very difficult. And what we face, and that I, certainly this is what I've faced in the times that I, we, we, you know, we're dealing with professionals even now, even post-diagnosis, there's more diagnosis to come. We're still fighting for an ADHD diagnosis for my daughter, even though it's widely acknowledged. We're still having to do things like uh, therapy sessions that might help her with managing her anxiety and things like that. Those are all things that are happening. CAMS are still involved. We have a psychiatrist involved. We have all these different things that we have to talk to. And, Engaging them in an appropriate way has become something I have found really, really important in progressing. Now, I used to work in sales, and one of the early lessons I, I, I learned in sales was that you can charge more than the guy next door, but if they like you, they'll buy from you compared to him. People buy relationally, and you get loyal customers who'll go to you regardless because they like who you are and what you do. And if you've been helpful, supportive, and engaging through a sales process, you're more likely to get to that point where someone says yes at the end of it. So I started applying that thinking to how I was dealing with the professionals I was dealing with. CAMS were a great example. And that's what I'm gonna kick off with, was the relationship with CAMS. Because I found, uh, and it seems to be a universal thing, that, that everybody I speak to has the same frustrations. And ironically, I've had a lot of conversations with actual CAMS workers off the record who share my frustrations. And that was a turning point for me in understanding. The system in place isn't their fault. They're trying to work as best they can within a system that's underfunded and overworked. They have got so much that they are continually having to do 
in order to, you know, just keep their heads above the water. So the waiting lists get longer and longer and longer. It gets harder and harder to get in contact and to try and chase things up. And you feel like you're constantly pushing, but they're in the same situation. They're as frustrated with it as you are. And I found finding that common ground really helped me. So a great example was with my daughter's autism diagnosis. Once we got to the place where that was in play, it was still a two year wait. So two years ago, we were told this is finally happening. We still had a two year wait to get to the point where a diagnosis came through. And I kept having to phone and push because we were getting more and more challenging situations that I was becoming less and less equipped to deal with as my, my daughter grew and developed and her needs changed and adapted. I needed that in place. I needed a diagnosis in place so that at least when I was going to a new professional, when I was approaching a new situation, I could go in and say with definite, you know, a definite diagnosis in place, my daughter is autistic. Once I found that common ground with CAMS, I found it much easier to talk to the people who were then assigned to me to be uh, our representatives within CAMS. So I could actually go in and say, look, I appreciate it's as difficult for you and I know you're as frustrated as I am, but here's the situation. Is there any way that we can escalate this? So I was trying to get my daughter's diagnosis expedited because we were really starting to edge into some really difficult territories. And I spoke recently about the fact that that really came to a head when I talked about it really hit crisis. My daughter had a psychotic episode and that triggered a lot of extra support. And I talked about that we've got a system that seems to rely on reaching crisis before there's any real support. What I did find was that leading up to that and since being able to engage on the level that is, I know you guys are struggling as much as we are with your situation, but here's my needs. And being able to express it in a way that was positive and not negative. So it was coming in with that non-defensive attitude and that was the hardest part for me. I've spoken before about parent blame and it's a big part of the diagnosis process. You will get blamed as a parent for everything until the point that diagnosis comes. And it will be, you know, you'll need to go on parenting courses. It's something that you're doing. Your child has a detachment disorder or something like that because they're going to blame it on you know, you clearly weren't present enough in early years and all that kind of stuff. We went through all of that and we were battered down time and time again. Again, why the diagnosis was so important, we needed to, for our own mental health and <laughs> well-being, be able to say we were right, you know. Uh, we weren't just talking out of our asses. This is something that is real and it's something that's important. When you're reaching that constant point of parent blame, you become naturally defensive. And I found myself going into new meetings and existing meetings with a point of being really, really, really defensive because you're expecting it. You're expecting to get that finger pointed at you and you're trying to bat it away before it's become. And, you know, my technique is always to, you know, a good offensive is better than a defensive. So my, my way of defending myself was to be very forward. I found that helpful in some ways, but I had to rein it in within the understanding that I needed these people on my side. How do I bring these people to be on my side? How do I work with them that they are going to start advocating for me? And I'm not just a pain in the ass because you become a pain in the ass. The only way to navigate the system these days is to constantly be making phone calls, constantly chasing up. The adage of the squeaky wheel gets the grease is just so evident. If you're not making noise, you're just going to get put to the bottom of the pile. It sucks, but it's the way it is. And I can't stress strongly enough, if you're going through the diagnosis process or if you're trying to get support one way or another, be the person that picks up the phone and constantly pegs away, constantly chips away at the old block and saying, look, we need this support. What's happening? Where are we at? Just asking the questions, trying to push things forward. Again, taking on that more friendly approach, being less defensive, but actually engaging and and putting forward my points but in a way that was more an evil sort of playing ground really helped it helped overcome that tendency that a lot of professionals have and i'm not saying all professionals but certainly it's there where you know we're the ones trained in this so i don't know if you, I, i'm i i wage my life <laughs> income on the fact that you've probably had this situation where with at least one professional, you faced it and there's this 
assumption that they know more than you because they've had some form of training. Now, in certain ways, that's going to be true. But the reality is we're the parents. We are the carers. We are the people spending every hour of every day with our kids, with our loved ones, with the people that we care for. We know them better than anybody else. And the system's slowly shifting. Certainly where I live in Devon, there's a, a big move to try and include carers and parents' input into the diagnosis process and to stop this parent blame side of things happening. But it's a slow process. It is happening. I think it's happening nationwide. But it, it doesn't remove it. And it is still there. When I was able to come into those meetings with a more positive outlook and be able to just say, you know, hey, what can we do? And it's things like those words, we. How can we help my daughter more? How can we push this forward? Including others in my things. It's not what can I do? What could, or what can you do? What can you do to help? Why aren't you helping? What's going on with you? Why is this taking you so long? Very accusational. When I start changing just that word you to we, how can we help? What can we do next? What are we not doing right that's not getting this push forward and getting my daughter the support she needs? Just that simple word change and the tone in which I was speaking, <laughs> drawing it back, being a little more calm, <laughs> was so important. The way I did this was I had a plan now. If ever I go into a meeting, I know what I want to say. I'll take notes. I'll actually make a point by point these are the things that I need to bring up. So TAF meeting is a really good example of this. So those who want to wear TAF meeting is a team around the family. And that's where the all the people involved with support for your child should be meeting together. And if somebody isn't, you can tell them you need to be at this meeting. You have that right. Before I go into a TAF meeting, I have a point by point list. I've read through. I don't have it with me in the thing. I, I make sure I've read through it a few times so that as I go in. But it may, you know, there's nothing wrong with having it there in front of you, a sheet of paper or notes app on your phone, just something there that says, these are the points I need to raise. With that in mind, I can then make sure that I can tick them off as I go, uh, mentally or physically, I can tick them off and I know that we've got those points across. So there's almost always a point where you'll be asked, so what's going on, you know, have you got anything? Okay, yes, I do. Actually, these are the things that are concerning me at the moment. These are the wins. Now, that was the other thing I found really handy, was not only to put the things, this, 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 for my own sanity, I started realizing I needed to put the positives in. We've really overcome this, actually, there's been great. And what I've learned to do is throw that back as a thanks. So if somebody's done something within the, the team around the family that I know and recognize has contributed to my daughter's progression, then I can say that. And what I would do is actually thank that person, thank them publicly in the forum of the meeting. By doing that, I'm going, thanks so much. It's made a real difference. That appreciation, it's contagious. And people see a different side to you. It's, it's a psychological game that we're playing. And going into it with that sort of different attitude I found has really helped and it draws people want to help more when you've recognized the support that you've been given it's encouraging to the person there thank you oh, I'm so glad you recognized that I was part of that even if it's not explicitly said by them they'll take that on so when I when I know that we've had progression I, I'll often make a point of noting who that's who's been responsible for that and, and how that's really helped an example was you know following on from the my, my, my daughter's episode a few months ago working with the psychiatrist when we were in the TAF meeting I've, I've been able to say thank you so much your input there has really helped I found this and then that can ease into but I've also noticed that it's created this other situation I don't know they're related but they may be and put that forward I found that approach really really helpful it's putting people on side and the more people we can draw into our little web if you like the better off we're going to be the less of a stress it's going to be. But I also find that it inspires others to want to go that extra mile, just push that little further because they recognize that you're appreciative. Put it into perspective of your own life. If you've got someone who's constantly coming to you and pointing fingers, you're gonna avoid that person. That's nature, that's, you know, why would you want that in your life? If we can go in with an understanding that these guys are human beings as well and they make mistakes, we need to draw attention to that. We need to rectify them. But the approach that we take in it is so important. And if we want to move forward, sometimes it's about swallowing our own pride.
and putting forward that we need to work together. So that we focus is so important. And moving on, I want to draw attention to the relationships we have with schools. So TAF meetings we have take place at my daughter's school or they've been taking place over Zoom or Teams at the moment, but they're, you know, focused within the school. I found my relationship with the school to be really important. Mainstream can be very, very challenging when we've got neurodivergent or disabled kids who we're constantly having to battle with the schools in a way. I, I speak to so many parents at my, my son's school through my group on Facebook who struggle with this because the schools seem to not want to listen. I found building those positive relationships really, really integral to how that works. An example I'll give is that we had a, a miscommunication happening between my daughter's school and myself, us as a family. My daughter, part of PDA can be kind of, <laughs> the word's manipulation, but it's not a necessarily a conscious manipulation. My daughter would go in with stories about home that were, it was gaining her attention. So what's going on? What's that? Great example is a bit of uh, the, the, the ceiling above her had just peeled away a little bit. She got into school and said that there was a hole in her roof and she couldn't sleep in her bedroom anymore. And the school were like, you know, what's, you know, why haven't you repaired the hole in your roof? I'm like, what? <laughs> and it turns out after a bit of discussion, this was what it was. What we were able to do is manufacture a situation where I could actually email my daughter's tutor each day. If there was an incident, I could say, this is what's occurred. And so we were in this miscommunication between us and the school by allowing that situation where I could just email or they could email me if there'd been an incident at school. I knew exactly what had happened so that when my daughter came in the door with the story, I could correct it as we went, well, actually, you'd done this first, hadn't you? Is that right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the reverse was happening at school. They were able to start challenging things. That relationship in place was so, so important. Reach out to your SENCOs. Actually talk to the people who are going to have a considerable impact. And if you're pre-diagnosis or in the process of diagnosis, you'll know the SENCO has a lot of sway in how that process goes. If you can get them on side early on, it will make a huge, huge, huge difference as to how that progresses in the school. I am uh, very close with the SENCO at my son's school. So my son's neurotypical, but because of my experience with my daughter and stuff like that, I've managed to develop a, a good relationship with the SENCO at my son's school. By developing that relationship and being positive, it makes a huge difference to how even if we've had an incident at home and my son can be affected by that, I'm now able to reflect that in a really positive way. I can actually say to my son's teacher or to the Senko, my son's been experiencing this at the moment. He may be a little on edge because he was targeted at home. He may be a little bit sensitive and you can keep an eye on that. When we come into going through the diagnosis process, trying to understand masking is a really hard thing for a lot of schools. It's something I've gone on a lot about on this channel, but masking is integral to be able to be identified. So you're going in and saying, oh, you know, I'm really struggling. The, 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 the aggression or the behaviors that we're experiencing at home are so difficult to manage. And the school are going, well, we're not seeing anything here. It's like a model student. If you have a positive relationship with the Senko to start with, and again, you have to kind of put aside that defensiveness and you almost let the past lay at rest. If there's been conflict before, you kind of need to, need to sort of bury the hatchet, let that rest and say, look, we need to move forward positively. How can we do that working together? When it comes to things like describing masking, if they've got no concepts of it, being able to raise it and say, look, I think what's happening is masking. If you want to stand masking, please don't go check out. I've done a number of episodes on masking. Links will be in the description, but masking is just an integral part of how a lot of kids work at school. So they're, they're bottling it all up all day. And then it's all coming out when they're in their safe place at home teachers aren't going to see that and my the Senko at my son's school actually said to me you know, how do I look for masking because I we, we talked about this and I said you know it's it's difficult but you know there are certain ways you can do it look for the repetitive behaviors so if you're hearing the same thing constantly in the same tone of voice that's a warning sign but I said the best thing you can do is watch the kids walk out at the end of the day if you've got a child you think maybe masking watch the transition between when they walk out of the door and when they reach their parent and if you see that shift, it may not happen. Sometimes they'll wait till they get home where you know they really feel safe. 
but you watch that transition between being in the school setting to being with their safe person and you'll often see masking exposed. She was really interested in that and it's not something she'd come across before. The difference was that the parents that she's been dealing with in a, to a large degree are so fed up, not just because of the school setting, but because of the whole system, that they're coming in with this aggression and this defensiveness. And it creates a very toxic relationship. And that's only going to impact on you negatively because in the end, they're just going to, uh, well, it's too hard basket, rightly or wrongly. That's what you know happens. That's what we do as humans. Developing those relationships is so important. And, you know, take the time, maybe addressing yourself. What, why, what am I feeling in this relationship? What am I feeling with this person? How can I resolve that so that I can go into this more positively? And then it's about taking control of your own emotions as you go into those meetings. And, you know, maybe bottling what you have to and go and find a punching bag afterwards or something like that. But something that you can do that helps create that more positive, less toxic atmosphere is just so important. Moving on from that, I think it's it's relationships with things like GPs and the professionals that we go to in the end that have such an important impact as well as time goes on. Trying to start those off as best we can is so important. I found I need to spend more time listening than I do talking. And there's the old adage that, you know, we've got two ears, one mouth, we should exercise that in our conversation. Realistically, it's more that I need them to know that I'm taking on board what they're saying and I'm not dismissing it. If I have an objection, I've listened and I can say that back. I hear what you're saying. What you're saying is this and this. Well, actually what I'm finding is this. So a prime example was, you know, early on we had to go through the parenting courses, parent blame, we went through it. We had to go on the, the, the parenting courses and one of the recommendations they seem to always make is our rewards charts are fantastic. They work every time. And I, you know, I said at the beginning, like, they really don't work for my daughter and here's why. Well, you need to try it anyway. And it was pushed and pushed. So, you know, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do it. And I went away for a week <laughs> and we went back the next week and I actually took with me the torn up <laughs> shreds of the, of the rewards chart that we used and said, well, here's the results. <laughs> and I said, that happened day one because I've explained my daughter's demand avoidant and the rewards chart is just simply putting in place for her a demand that she has to meet up to. It creates anxiety and she went into meltdown and she's destroyed the chart. That's the reality. That's what we're dealing with. What I'd done was taken on board. I'd gone, you know what? I, I put my ejection in. Then I said, okay, I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna try it. I went away and tried it. And I went back with the evidence and I said, here's the situation we're facing. When we've got the demand avoidance side of things, these things don't work. And what I need is support in learning my way around the demand avoidance and how to stop triggering my daughter's anxiety in that way. It was a huge lesson for me to learn. It was a huge lesson for them to learn. Once we got into that dialogue, because I'd been willing to listen, willing to take on board and willing to try, it made a huge difference in how they responded to me afterwards and how we could progress from there. Now, it's the same with GPs and things like that. Talking to GPs can be really difficult because you're relying on them to maybe get the diagnosis put into process, you know, get the referrals put through. Listening, and you know, I understand, you know, you know what, I, 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 maybe it's even saying things along the lines of, I, I see there's probably a lot of people coming to you who are concerned and may be concerned for the wrong reasons. Maybe there's something else going on. But in that case, I've gone in prepared. So I've gone back in with my, I come into that meeting, you know, meeting with the GP with my list of these are the things I'm observing. And I, something I say to a lot of people is if you can get video evidence, bring it with you, back it up. Even if it's just the audio, you put the phone in your pocket and you've got it recorded of a situation going on. You can then replay that back. And I was speaking to someone earlier this week who had exactly that situation. They were being told this is perfectly, you know, this is, this is an everyday occurrence. All kids go through this. And, she went away and she recorded the stuff and she went when she went back to to follow up she said right you told me last time this was you know everyday behavior all kids go through this here's what i'm experiencing and once the doctor the gp had seen what she was talking about it was like oh okay no that's not standard yes we need to put a referral through and that kicked the process off for her that's the kind of stuff that's the difference it can make so being prepared in that way, going in with that evidence with you. For me, taking in that torn up reward chart and saying, this is what the result was. Actually, we had a four hour meltdown following it. It created many more issues than it would, you know, 
it didn't solve anything and just created us a, a, a thousand more things we had to deal with. So that's, you know, a really important facet of it, being prepared, but also being able to listen and respond appropriately so that you are emphasizing that we're in this together. This is you and me. It's a we, it's not a me, it's not a you. And it takes away the whole finger pointing emphasis that we can go in with because we feel that on us. We feel the fingers pointing at us all the time. And that follows up with the meetings we've had afterwards. What we do after the meeting, what we do after the conversation, what we do after the appointment. Take notes in an appointment if you can. Some people that can be really difficult. Something you can ask is, look, do you mind if I just put, if I record this on audio on my phone, just so I can go back and go over it later on. Often, more often than not, people are actually quite okay with that. It may cause issues. If it does, if it's going to cause an issue, that's fine. Don't worry. Okay, that's no worries. You're being, you're working with them. Try and take some notes. But something that I found really helpful, and somebody, somebody, something somebody recommended to me to do, was ask for the notes from the people who are there. Do you mind if I get a copy of your notes, just so that I've got something? And they may say, oh, my writing, so it's okay, I just need to, if I can take a quick photo on my phone, it just gives me something to refer back to so I can follow up on the things that we've talked about. I want to do the right thing here. I want to follow up properly. I struggle taking notes and listing at the same time. Your notes would be really helpful to me. A lot of the time people would be very happy to eat. It, obviously there's certain elements that can't, they can't be shared in that way. We have to accept that. But so often it's really good to be able to just go, can I have a copy of that? just so I've got something to refer back to as I follow up on all this stuff. Keep all your notes together if you can. Have a folder at home, somewhere you can keep it that's safe, that you can put everything into, and you've got it there all. Best thing I think is probably either have it in sections of, you know, maybe you're dealing with one section for school, one section for GPs and the NHS or the referral process, one section for professionals you've been referred to, however you want to do it that works for you and then in date order so I know I can flick back through if necessary. For me, I keep it all on my phone. I actually keep things in, in folders on my phone. You can do it on your PC or whatever. I, if, if I've got something written, I'll just scan it or photo it and get that put in that way. So I've got it there. I find my phone's a really useful tool. This thing is just so useful for all that kind of stuff because what it does is it's with me all the time. And sometimes I'll be thinking of something and I can quickly open my apps and just take a quick note and then, you know, later on, add it in properly or just quickly find where I'm at and just something and I want to make on that. I find having that with me as I'm thinking those things really useful. Having an organized process afterwards and then flagging the things that you need to follow up on. So for me, it was using my calendar app on my phone and just going, that's something I need to follow up on. I need to, I'm dreadful in my memory. If I, it, when I've got something to do, if I haven't noted it in my calendar or on my phone, I'm stuffed. So I make sure everything goes on in there, you know, even down to taking the bins out. <laughs> I've got a fortnightly reminder that comes up to remind me, got to take the bins out tonight. But for things like following up, it's so useful to have a little reminder pop up. You need to follow up with the GP. You need to follow up with the Senko. You need to follow up with whoever on this. I find that really, really helpful because it is a prompt and then I can pick up the phone and I can just, or, you know, throw out an email. Hey, you know, this is, it's been a couple of weeks. Can you please give me an update on what's happening? And again, it's keeping the tone right. Emails and messages can be really hard to add tone to. So I find a really good practice for me is to read back over things a few times just to make sure I'm not coming across as condescending or aggressive or anything like that. I want them to work with me. And that's constantly what's in the back of my mind now is how do I approach this so that I can keep them on side? And so this is a discussion I have with my wife often because my wife really struggles with this and to the point that she now says, you do the meetings. You're so much better at it than me because she is so, you know, traumatized by the experiences we've had. And it's something I've had to deal with and I'm just in a better place to be able to do that within those situations. And that leads on to, being positive with those things as well. While we're chasing, I make a point now, if, if something good's happened, I, I do a message straight away. I'll send an email or I'll pick up the phone to say thank you. The advice you gave me in that meeting the other day, something I hadn't considered, it really helped. I just had a win with this. So I just wanted to say thank you, that really helped. If somebody's followed something up, 
if you get a message saying, I put a referral through here for you, being able to respond and say, thank you so much. You've got no idea what it means to me. I really appreciate you listening. Again, it's putting that positivity back in. You're encouraging people to warm to you, to want to work with you, to help you and support you. And it's purely down to the psychology of how we relate to people. And for me, it was getting over my own traumas, my own damage from the past, if you like, and being able to reset the meter and say, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna progress from here like this. And I'm gonna turn this from, you know, me and you into we. Which brings us neatly into what do you do if you're concerned about something that's taking place? So you may have something you've been told you need to try and it's not working and you need to address it or you're concerned about maybe there's a, a dynamic within your, the people who are working around you that isn't working. I can't stress enough, address it as soon as you can, but do it in a constructive way. For me, that would be, actually, I, I would go in and highlight, look, we're all in this together and I, I know that the goal for all of us is that, and it comes back to my mantra I want my daughter's t tomorrow to be better than it has been today constantly improving her position in life so that she can go forward with confidence and be happy by often raising that at the beginning look I know we're all in this together I'm concerned about this situation that's occurring what can we do to address this what can we do to fix this Again, turning it into a we and being inclusive. And sometimes I find making an apology of my own can really help, even if I don't feel I need to apologize. But I can go in and I, I'll often go in with just a, look, the last meeting we had, I got a bit tense and I think I might have contributed to that. I'm sorry if I came across abruptly or anything like that. I do apologize. Again, I just want my daughter to be happy and, and healthy and, and have a better tomorrow than today. I think we're all working toward that, but I noticed that there was a tension that built in the room. How can we address that? It can be a really useful thing. And you've got a right to have people there who may be able to support you in that. You can have uh, you know, people there who are friends or professionals that you've brought in to be your support network within that. Check always first that you know the person is appropriate. But if you feel you need that, you have those rights. I strongly recommend reaching out to your local advisory service for, for Devon, it's Diaz. Uh, they, they are there for parents of uh, kids who have disability or send needs and they are there to support them and they, they had advocacy programs that are there to help. If you need someone there, they can often work ways to go through that. Again, your local carers charity, there are loads. Carers UK is probably the most obvious around here. We've got Devon Carers, any of those kind of things. Approach them and say, this is the situation. I feel I need someone advocating for me because I'm... And not everyone's a good communicator. Not everyone's good at writing things down. Maybe we have our own issues. Maybe I'm, you know, I could be dyslexic. How am I going to take notes in a, a meeting or read other people's notes? You have a right to address those things within those things so that you come in with an even and fair balance. So reaching out to the right people to support and maybe give advice and even come in and mediate if necessary. You know, you can engage those things. Yes, it's going to be some phone calls on your part or some emails and reaching out on your part but the benefits are gonna be so much better. But being able to address the issues straight away is so integral. It's, it's they're, they're cancerous, if you like. You know, cancer starts off in one cell and then spreads. And I tend to find this in, you know, if you've worked, uh, you, know, in, you know, I worked in corporate situations and you find that if there's that one thing that's starting to go sour, if it's starting to fester, it quickly spreads. So you need to cut it out as soon as you can, but you need to do it in a way that's not only decisive, but fair, equitable, and filled with an understanding and reminding people why we're here, what we're here to do. So that's what I wanted to say. These are the things that I've learned over my time. Hopefully they help some of you in your situations and in what you're facing. It's a difficult process we all go through. It is fraught with frustration and knockbacks and knockdowns, and we have to keep getting back up and fighting. Insert the Rocky montage here. <laughs> um, that's really what it's like. It's constantly having to just get back up and get back up. And you know, the way in which we do that and the way in which we present ourselves when we do that makes such a difference to the people, the professionals, and the support networks we have around us to do and engaging in a positive way that is bringing the people in around us to support us. We need their support. We need them around us. We need them to be working with us, not you know dismissing us or working against us. It's so important. It's so hard to do, but the rewards, trust me, 
are so much better than you know what I was facing with the uphill battle that I was facing previously. Once I started to engage in a positive way, it made a real difference to how I was able to progress with my daughter and getting diagnosis and getting the support structures we needed in place to help her to be happier, to have a better life and to feel supported herself and safe herself. Thanks so much for joining me. As usual, please do hit like, subscribe, ring the bell. It makes such a difference to the people who get to hear this. As I said before, it triggers all the algorithms. Importantly too, I want to hear your feedback. If you've been in a situation where you've had to you know, maybe reconsider how you're going in to a, a meeting, to talking with professionals, what tips have you learned? I'd love to hear them in the comments. They'll help other people. Please do put them in. Also, frustrations. What, are you, what, what roadblocks are you hitting? Maybe there's something that we can all do to help as a community. Please put them in the comments. Thank you so much for joining me. I will see you again on the next episode, but in the meantime, please do stay safe.